I'm very happy to be in Bratislava, my first visit to this city. Um, however, I was walking past the room earlier today, and I stopped by uh, outside the door occasionally to listen. And I had two thoughts. One was that you were being told a lot of information over a long period of time. And secondly, that much of it was being said in English by people who were talking very fast. And so I am going to try to talk a little slower. And I am also not going to give a formal lecture in the usual sense of that term. Consider the next 40 minutes to be a one-sided conversation where I'm going to be introducing some ideas that I think you need to think about. But then after that, we can discuss them in a two-sided version uh, during the question and answer period. You are living in a very fortunate time. When I say you, I am assuming that a great many people in this audience are liberal in the European sense. Uh, Peter told me that maybe 90% of you are. In fact, I'm a little worried that you will think I am too moderate, uh, which is a problem I don't usually have. But when I say you are fortunate to be living in this place and at this time, I mean that over the course of the next not too many years, Europe is going to change fundamentally. Uh, it's going to change everywhere in Europe, uh, including Slovakia. And I can predict that very confidently because of a few very hard facts that most of you already know, but let me go through them. You have too few babies and too many old people. That's just a fact of life. Uh, the birth rate here in Slovakia, I'm told, is about 1.3. Uh, that's uh, on the low end of what we see throughout Europe. Replacement of the population, 2.1. Uh, the population is getting older rapidly. I don't know what the numbers are for Slovakia. I know that in Spain, for example, uh, they are going to go from about 16% of their population aged 65 or older to about 25% uh, over the course of the next 15 or 20 years. That's a huge number of people who are no longer working, no longer contributing. It is true throughout Europe. And one of two things has to happen. We still have a few more chairs down in the first row here, and we have a few chairs in the first and second rows too. So please don't hesitate to come on down and take them. One of two things has to happen. Option number one, you let in a lot of immigrants, and I mean a lot, working-aged immigrants who will continue to pay taxes and will support elderly Slovakians, or in France, elderly French, or in Germany, elderly Germans. The problem is that these immigrants, if they are let in, are not going to come from Czechoslovakia. They are not going to come for es from Estonia, for that matter. They are going to come, if you let in large numbers, from places like the Middle East, where there will be Muslim, or they will come from uh, sub-Saharan African countries. Perhaps they will come from South Asia. But there is one thing that all of these immigrant groups will have in common. They will not share Slovakian culture, just as the immigrants to France have not shared French culture, culture and the immigrants to the Netherlands have not shared the Netherlands culture. Furthermore, we know from experience over the last several years that these immigrants are not becoming French are not becoming Dutch, and probably will not become Slovakia. And this is especially true of immigrants from the Middle East. On the contrary, they will come into the country 
and in some cases actively despise the culture that they are entering. So if you go that route of having lots and lots of immigrants to pay for the welfare state, I think you had better be prepared for Slovakia to stop being Slovakia within a very few years, just as I'm afraid Germany will stop being Germany and France will stop being France. I don't think that's actually going to happen. And the reason I don't is that Europe has a long and proud history. And I just don't see the French giving up France. I don't see the Germans giving up Germany. And I don't see why Slovakia should give up Slovakia. Uh, instead, if you don't do that, then it is absolutely certain that the welfare state as it is presently practiced in Western Europe, will stop. It will have to have cuts that are so radical that it will be a different system. Again, this is mathematics. There's no way around it, as far as I can tell. What we saw with Greece was the first step in this process. We are going to see an additional uh, need for money from Spain, from Portugal, from Ireland, these countries are all not that much different from Greece. And uh, what's going to happen to the Eurozone, what's going to happen to the rest of it, I don't know. You will have an opportunity to be present at a time that fundamental changes will have to be made in the welfare state. And now is a good time to start thinking about what those changes ought to be. You have had uh, a variety of speakers today who have made the case in many different ways. Uh, they have talked about the economics of the social welfare democracy versus the economics of capitalism and limited government. Uh, I, you may have, I do not know for sure, but I would not be surprised if you have not had arguments about natural rights and the other bases for saying that the role of government should be strictly limited. I am going to give you a third kind of discussion, which I will call the happiness argument. And it is one that I think would be worth your thinking about, because you are going to be needing to talk to Slovakians who don't agree with you. You need to talk to Slovakians who like the welfare state, and you've got to give them reasons for saying there is a better way that go beyond strict libertarian arguments. And I think there are such arguments to be made, very important arguments. Let me review quickly the, the reason why the welfare state seemed like such a natural thing to do uh, starting in the early part of the 20th century. You had the assumption by most people, and it's, it was not a stupid assumption, that the state can allocate material resources to its people without damaging the social <coughs> fabric of the country. It seemed simple. You had elderly people who did not have any money and they needed to live a dignified old age, so give them a pension. Uh, you have men who are unemployed, they can't find jobs even though they are trying to find jobs, so give them a job or give them some support while they look for a job. There's no problem with that if the person continues to look for a job really hard. And so the welfare state grew because it was doing things that seemed sensible and there was increasing economic wealth in the country that made it possible to be more generous than you could be in the 1700s or the 1800s. It all seemed very straightforward. And at first it worked pretty well. And it worked best in countries that were small, that were ethnically homogeneous, and that had wonderful cultural capital. Consider Sweden, for example. It had about uh, five or six million people when its welfare state grew. It still doesn't have that many more, 
Uh, they were all Swedes. They all brought to uh, the welfare state the Swedish personality, which is very hardworking uh, and very serious and very willing to share burdens. And also, they had 400 years of Lutheran Christian teachings about being uh, kind to their fellow man and working hard and being good citizens. So it worked. I once was giving a lecture in Stockholm, Sweden, uh, when I said the problem with that is that almost any system of government will work for a while if you are governing the Swedes. But it's harder if you're governing Italians or Greeks or Americans or a variety of other people. So the welfare state worked really well in Scandinavia. It worked well in the Netherlands. It worked pretty good in France and Germany for a while. And then we started to see the problems arise. Uh, where people were unemployed, but they really weren't looking that hard for a new job because the unemployment benefits were so high that they didn't really need to look for a job uh, that much. You had other problems which were less obvious, but potentially much more explosive. I am going to raise a sensitive topic at this point, and that is women having babies without husbands, and the welfare state providing for their support. Well, there is a school of thought which says the family is evolving, uh, women have equal rights now, so why not? Well. The reason why not is something that has been explored a lot in the United States by social scientists of both the left and the right. And the answer is, children need fathers. Uh, it's not the case that a single mother cannot raise successful children. Of course she can. But statistically, not having a father creates real problems for the development of children. And it shows up in everything from their emotional health uh, to their ability to hold jobs, to the likelihood that they will become arrested, to the likelihood that they will take drugs, or less concretely, to the likelihood that they will not be happy, productive adults. But it didn't seem like a problem in the beginning. But now when you have 30 or 40 or 50 percent of all children growing up without fathers, in many countries, you have a new kind of problem nobody thought about, which is that you now have little boys growing up to adulthood who have never seen more than one or two men behaving in the ordinary roles of a hard-working father and a good spouse. Well, little boys choose role models to imitate. And if they have a father, they will choose the father as the role model if he's around. If he does not, if he is not around, who do they choose? Teenage boys. There is no worse role model in the world for a little boy than a teenage boy. But we have seen in the United States, and we are increasingly seeing in Europe, what happens when you have large numbers of children born without fathers. The welfare state is deeply, deeply guilty for that phenomenon. So you have problems that arose. Now you have the financial crisis that is coming in addition. Things will have to change. How should they change? And uh, how do you make the case? First point, I know many of you in this room are also libertarians like me. And you think the state should not provide any assistance whatsoever. In principle, I agree with you. I have written a book called What It Means to Be a Libertarian, where I make that case. Here is the reality. In the advanced countries of the West, and for that matter in Japan, uh, there is just too much money for there to be no redistribution at all. We are going to spend money on redistribution. And the question is, how do we spend it with the least possible damage? Uh, and to say that somehow you can change that 
I will argue with you, you're going to miss opportunities for a better system if you try for perfection. So how do you spend the money with the least harm? Milton Friedman, back in the 1940s, came up with the idea of the negative income tax. You have, many of you are familiar with it. You set a limit, you set a level which is a floor of income, one which will enable people to live a decent living. And if they don't make that much money, you add on to that until they come up to the floor. And Milton Friedman, who was a very good libertarian, uh, did not say this was ideal. He said it's a lot better than the system we have now. A few years ago, I wrote a book called In Our Hands, where I <laughs> took up his case. I don't think the negative income tax is quite right. I think you're better off thinking in terms of a guaranteed income. But the principle is the same. That, that you take everything you are currently spending, everything, pensions, uh, child care, you name it, everything, convert it to cash, and give out to every adult, not the children. You don't give extra money for children. You give to every adult a monthly allowance, in effect. And from this guaranteed income, the individual is supposed to plan for his retirement, deal with uh, unemployment when it comes along, and otherwise use that money along with whatever he earns as a way of running his own life. And you don't get anything in addition to that. So if you run out of money, you are going to have to go to family or friends or relatives or a charity or someplace and hope that somebody will help you because the government has no other programs at all. Now, as soon as I say this is the plan, I can just see in the audience all of the questions arising about why it won't work. Uh, and I will go through just a couple of those, but I will say to you my own belief that the difficulties can be overcome. Let me give you one example. Um, some people will spend all their money on drugs and alcohol uh, the first week and uh, starve in the streets. Well, what you do is you do not give out the money on January 1st in euros. Uh, everybody has to have a bank account. And every month there is an electronic deposit into that bank account. So you can take the money and you can waste it in the first week of that month, but you only have to survive three more weeks until uh, you get some more. A second obvious disadvantage to any of these plans is work disincentives. It's a huge problem for the negative income tax because let's say the floor were set at uh, 3,000 euros. I'm making up that number, so don't take it too seriously. But suppose the floor is 3000 and I have a job that pays me 2500 a year, um, and the government is going to increase my amount to 3000 there's no point in me working for that extra 500 euros. That's uh, a simple example of the general problem of work disincentives. How do you get around that? You don't start cutting the benefits as soon as they hit the minimum. You, let's, say that, let's say that the uh, guaranteed income is, again, I will say 3,000 euros. Uh, I, I, I propose that if you make 2,000 euros, you keep the entire 3,000 in addition, so you have a total of five. And if you go up to 5,000 euros that you earn in your own salary, you still get the three and you now have a total of eight. And that you keep that up until you reach a very high level. Why do I want to do that? Because I want to trick people into working until they're making so much money that they can't afford to quit. So that if and let's say that you have to you start losing some of the 3,000 euro uh, guaranteed income after you hit 
15,000 euro income. Well, if you quit your job at that point, you're going to go from a total of 18,000, 15 plus 3, down to 3. Nobody wants to do that. Uh, you are giving up way too much. Whereas if you are working for 4,000 and you give it up and you only have 3, that's not such a big problem. So there, there are ways to reduce the work disincentives. Administratively, the program is very simple. The government doesn't do many things very well, but it does spend money well in the sense it can get the money out the door. And so you would have uh, some computers with bank account numbers in them, and every month the money would go out, and the whole thing could be done by a staff of 15 people plus computers. Very cheap system. All right. That's the very bare bones of what I want to do. Why do I want to do it? Well, there are short-term outcomes such as nobody would have to be poor. Let's go back to a single mother. Let's go back to a single mother who, uh, uh, she has a child, she does not have a husband. Let's say she can't work. And the guaranteed income is 3,000 euros. Well, you say a mother and a child can't live on 3,000 euros. Maybe not. But two women with children who share their expenses, 6,000 euros for two women and two children isn't that bad. And if they get together with three or four, so it's nine or 12,000 euros, it becomes quite possible to live a decent existence with just the minimum income. But how do you do that? You have to establish relationships with other people. You can't do it by going to the government for a bigger check. And why is that a good thing? Because poor women who are with their children and having to cooperate on how to deal with this are also going to be a resource for each other in terms of dealing with their problems. And they are also going to have to learn how to cooperate with each other or else they will be on their own again, which is a bad thing. And I have now just given you the real reason why I want to have this kind of plan. When you start giving government assistance in the form of a guaranteed income, you have the effect of energizing all kinds of civil society which are rich and deep and useful and valuable. Let's go to the case of the man who has uh, drunk uh, all of his money up in the first week. And now we're not talking in the abstract. He's got to survive for the next three weeks until he gets some more money. He has to go ask somebody for help. Now, when you go to ask the government for help, the bureaucrats decide whether you meet such and such a rule, and they go through their check boxes, and eventually they may just hand you some money if you qualify. If you go to your brother for money because you've drunk all your money up, he's not going to stop there. He's going to say, all right, I will not let you starve in the streets, but you've got to start to get your act together, to use a good English phrase. Uh, you've got to start dealing with this, because don't tell me that you have no way of responding to the problems in your life. I know that you're getting some money every month, and it's up to you to start learning how to behave responsibly. Multiply that conversation by 100 million, because there will be 100 million such conversations every month around the country as various people who are not responsible uh, start to realize that there are consequences to their actions, and their friends and relatives and neighbors will hold them responsible for that. That's good. That's not bad. That's good. So no involuntary poverty, lots of positive signals to do, to behave better. I'm still not where to the real reason I want to do this. And I said earlier I was going to talk to you about the happiness argument. Here it comes. Limited government with this kind of cash supplement 
is the best way for human beings to live a satisfying life. I've got an idea I want you to think about. The real problem that advanced societies have, especially the really rich ones, the Swedens and the Frances and the United States and the rest of them, is not poverty. It's not any kind of material problem. The real problem is how to live a satisfying life in an age of plenty. It's not the poor people who have a problem, it's the rich people as well. Here's what I mean. It used to be that living a satisfying life kind of took care of itself. By used to be, I'm talking about 10,000 years ago. Let's see now, to stay alive, uh, you needed to be part of a functioning community because human beings all by themselves had a real hard time surviving. And that meant you needed to be a good neighbor within your community. You needed to be accepted. <laughs> Another thing you had to do uh, if you wanted to survive was find a mate. If you were a woman, you had to find a mate because you needed someone to help support you while you were raising the baby. And if you were a man, you needed to have children because you needed children to support you in your old age. And you needed a woman who would commit herself to you to help you do that. Uh, you also had to do things like attend uh, to spiritual concerns because 10,000 years ago, it was quite obvious you could die tomorrow like that. And you had better be thinking about your spiritual life. These days, you don't have to do any of those things. You can live a very pleasant life uh, with a few sex partners, one after another, uh, with a job that you find okay and pleasant. Uh, and you don't really have to worry about spiritual matters because we all think we've got at least another 20 years left. I'm 67 years old. I don't really think about dying tomorrow. I figure I've got several more years left. And those of you who are 30 and 40 never need to worry about that. Well, here's the problem. In forming families and communities, in, uh, in, in having to provide for oneself with a vocation, usually hunter or, or farmer, and with attending to spiritual matters, people in the old days, just by trying to stay alive, were tapping into the four frameworks for deep satisfactions. Challenge for the audience. During the question period, one of you who wants to respond to the challenge, go ahead. Here is what I'm saying. If you're talking about deep satisfactions, and by that I mean things that when you get to be my age, you are able to look back and be proud of who you have been and what you have done. That kind of deep satisfaction has only four frameworks. Family, vocation, community, and faith. Now vocation doesn't have to be just your job. Uh, a mother has a vocation. Someone who is passionately committed to a political cause, like some people in this room, have something that I would call a vocation. Uh, but other than that, I'm saying anything you can think of that is a source of deep satisfaction comes from one of those four. You don't have to use all four. Some people are devoted to their jobs, love their jobs, don't have any time for a family uh, or religion or community. I have a feeling that by the time those people get to be 60, they feel kind of lonely, but they're really very, they're getting a lot of satisfaction from their job. Uh, other people, their entire lives are dominated by their faith and by their family. So there are lots of different combinations, but those four are all there are. If that's the case, then what you need in a society is to have all four of those frameworks be full of vitality, to be rich and full of energy. And the paradox is, 
that every time the government intervenes in any one of those four, it drains energy away from it. Now let's go back to the example of uh, children. There are many parents in this room. Every one of those parents will agree, I think, that children are not always a source of joy. <laughs> that often raising children is <laughs> a pain. Um, and yet, nonetheless, in the long run, they, they are a source of, of joy. Well, it's not because raising children is easy. It's because you as parents have the responsibility for doing it. And if, for example, you are a parent who never sees the child, you're a father who walks out, if your child turns out to be a good human being, you can be happy about that. You can't take satisfaction in it because you haven't done the work. Well, when the state starts to take over the duties of parents, when it gets easier to support a child, when you have help with the daycare, when you can leave the child for long periods of time, when, when the state takes the trouble out of raising a child, it also takes some of the satisfaction out of raising a child. There's no way to avoid it. The same thing happens with jobs. To hold a job, and to do it in a way that people say you've done a good job is really satisfying. And this is true even if the job itself is pretty boring. It's, it's good to be in a situation where you are rewarded by people saying, you're doing great. Well, if your job is guaranteed, if you can't be fired, you lose some of that satisfaction. If what you accomplish by making the money at that job isn't much except to pay for vacations, you lose some of the satisfaction of vocation. And they're all intertwined. Another example. I'm not talking now about rich people. I'm not talking about people with interesting jobs. Let's say you have somebody down the street here who is working as a laborer. Uh, he's just hard manual work. If with the money he takes home, he is supporting a wife and children, and he can really say to himself, if it weren't for me, my wife and children would be in big trouble. That man is doing something important with his life genuinely important. We are just patting him on the back and trying to make him feel good. He has a genuine reason for self-satisfaction. Suppose that man knows that if he walks out tomorrow, his wife and his children will be just as well off financially because the state will pay for it. This, he is, his satisfaction at what he is doing for his job goes away. We can argue about whether it's worth it. We can say, well, it's more important to provide the social support for the mother and the children than it is to give this man satisfaction in his work. Okay, we can argue. But what you cannot say is that the state has not taken away a source of satisfaction from that man. So here's a conversation I want you to have as you make the argument <coughs> for a different way of organizing society. Right now, as far as I can tell in Europe, not Slovakia, I'm thinking of Western Europe now, the advanced countries, there is a philosophy of life which says that we live and we die and there's no meaning and all we do is pass away the time as pleasantly as possible and the role of government is to make it as easy as possible to pass the time as pleasantly as possible. That, I think, is the, the philosophy of a lot of young Europeans in Western Europe these days. It's time to start saying, no, that's not all there is to life. Life can have transcendental meaning. 
transcendental being a, a big English word, uh, can be a source of deep satisfactions. It can be religious in nature. It can be based on the great philosophies. But a human life well lived can have meaning and depth that make it more than whiling away the time. And the welfare state's real evil is not that it costs too much money, though it does. It is not that it is inefficient, though it is. Uh, it is not that it infringes on our rights to freedom, though it does. The real problem with the welfare state is that it drains too much of the life out of life. We have enough money now that we can make material want, you know, just being unable to get enough money to live, we can solve that problem. But what we have to do is solve it in a better way than we have done. We have to solve it in a way that gives all people, not just rich people, not just people with academic degrees, a chance at a satisfying life. And that, I think, is a job that we can do. When I have talked about these points with people in the United States who are on the left, they don't really argue with me about their own lives. If, if we're talking about what has it been that has given satisfaction to your life, they will agree that family, faith, community, and vocation have been the sources of that. But then they say, yes, that's true of you, and that's true of me, because we've been lucky and fortunate in our talents and our money, but that's not true of everyone. We can't expect everyone to be like that. And that is when, as you engage in conversation with people who don't agree with you, you must say this, you're wrong. Everyone is like that. Everyone needs a life of dignity. Everyone needs a life of meaning. And the way to that dignity and to that meaning is freedom. Thank you very much.